Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is um, about the book of Jeremiah. This is lesson number six in that series for November 7 of 2015. It's entitled Symbolic Acts. Now, if you know a little bit about the life of Jeremiah, you might already have some ideas in your head about what kind of symbolism is involved in the experience of Jeremiah, but let's jump in the lesson and see what we can learn. I hope you have your Bible handy. We're going to be looking at several passages, but we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to meet with friends to talk about you and to consider your holy word. As we now spend some time thinking about Jeremiah, who lived 2,500 years ago, and the challenges that he had facing those who opposed his messages, may we learn the lessons that you intend for us to learn as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What's the use of symbols? The Bible's full of symbols. What are they for? Words are symbols of ideas. Yeah, words are symbols of ideas, those little squiggly things on the page. Yeah. Some things are not material. And okay. It could take, um, sometimes material things become a symbol for the non-material thing. Happen. That can happen. Um, sometimes we use, or sometimes teachers use symbols to solidify something in the mind so they, uh, so people like me, can understand it and associate it with this plant or this uh, whatever, okay. as opposed to some abstract idea. Yeah. Symbols have a pointing function. In other words, the focus is not on those few symbols, the, the, the symbol itself. Hopefully, you when you see that, you think of something bigger, something different, something that it's pointing to. That's a pointing function. Um, let's, let's take just a moment to talk about one of the most famous symbols in Scripture, the earthly sanctuary. When was it first made? It's not a tough question. At the question. foot of Sinai. Yeah. At the foot of Mount Sinai, yeah. The first year the children of Israel were out of Egyptian slavery, bondage, and so forth. Um, Ellen White has some interesting things to say about the sanctuary service, and then we're going to ask some other questions. The significance of the Jewish economy is not yet fully comprehended. Truths vast and profound are shouted forth in its rites and symbols. The gospel is the key that unlocks its mysteries. Through a knowledge of the plan of redemption, its truths are opened to the understanding. Christ's Object Lessons, page 133, paragraph 1. Think of some other people in the Old Testament now that we're primarily focusing on the Old Testament. They use some powerful symbols. What about the prophet Daniel? Of course, who gave him those symbols? God. God, God gave him those yeah. symbols, right? Yeah, think of the, the statue in Daniel 2 and the beasts in Daniel 7 and 8 and 9 through 11, another kind of prophecy there. Symbols were used very effectively by God and Daniel. Uh, didn't Jesus use a lot of symbols and parables? You can think about the men sowing a seed. You can think about houses collapsing because the rains are heavy. You can think about all kinds of things. And uh, even, you know, the, the vineyard with the, the guy that goes away and leaves the vineyards in the, house, in, in the hands of, of uh, some uh, tenants. And they are in the process of killing everybody who comes to try to collect his share. And it's pretty obvious if you hear that story that He's not talking about some guy who owns a vineyard, <laughs> you know. So that is an example of a parable that has a pointing function. What, what are the advantages of using symbols like that as opposed to just bluntly saying, well, this is what I mean? Well, they said the pictures could be a, like a thousand words, so mm -hmm. the symbol would be to convey a message without spending mm -hmm. a lot of... Okay. Very and good. I, words. And I can remember that picture mm -hmm. better than I can remember the thousand words. 
Christ was a master of it. He could say things in parables that the agrarian society of its day understood and didn't get him into trouble with the higher-ups. And that's an important point because if you tell a story, like Jesus did this repeatedly oh, with the yes. scribes and Pharisees, told a story and the meaning was obvious. But So he didn't say anything. He just let everybody draw the... So you can't, you can't take someone to court yes. for telling a story, Couldn't right? Couldn't down, no. <laughs> pretty tricky kind of an affair. Well, the symbolism starts way back in the beginning uh, in the book of Genesis. Look at the story of Cain and Abel, Genesis 4, starting with verse 3. After some time, Cain brought some of his harvest and gave it as an offering to the Lord. Then Abel brought the first lamb born to one of his sheep, killed it, and gave the best parts of it as an offering. The Lord was pleased with Abel and his offering, but he rejected Cain and his offering. Cain became furious, and he scowled in anger. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why that scowl on your face? If you had done the right thing, you would be smiling. But because you have done evil, sin is crouching at your door. It wants to rule you, but you must overcome it. And of course, what was the end result of all that? Killed his brother. He ended up killing Abel, didn't he? Killing his brother. What, I mean, Cain has vegetables because he's a gardener and Abel has sheep, has a lamb because he's a shepherd, so why not give what you have? You know, What's you're wrong with that? that um, God told him what he wanted. Yeah, but are you saying that the vegetables didn't do it? I'm, I'm asking you why, I mean... It was his attitude that he, that he approached uh, everything with. So it wasn't what he brought, it was something else? Uh, what well, I instructed I'm asking you. The Bible doesn't tell us that, that, that I can remember that he says you to bring a, a lamb or, or a, anything. You bring just, your first fruits. Is, well, I don't even says that. You just, you know, well, not before that. that, that he wanted, after that, we read into yeah. some, back into something there, but it's not in the original text. The Bible doesn't chronologically give it before that yeah, time. That's right. But it was probably told before that oh, time. Yeah. Yeah, sure. That's yeah. Uh, yeah, you well, can't I always say that, though. Why I can. can you ca yeah, you I can, can say, say it. I can say it probably was. <laughs> you can say it, but well, how can you get anywhere with do, saying that? Because we, you don't know for sure. Ellen White cer yeah. strongly suggests. Strongly yeah. suggests? Yeah. Or maybe explicitly well, says. Yeah, no, she explicitly talks about Adam offering the first lamb. So that would have to be before this story. Well, um, the first lamb. Yeah. Was, that, was that the purpose of their gathering, to bring lambs to? Well, let, let, let's, let's, since we're talking about symbolism, let's not worry about that for a moment. Let's talk about what's wrong with bringing vegetables as opposed to bringing a lamb. Well, you, if you're you a farmer, if you're a farmer, what else can you do? I mean, if you're a vegetable farmer, what else can you do? was attitude. Okay, here's the difference. What is that sacrifice of that lamb supposed to teach us? Penalty of sin. sin yes. What's the sin penalty of sin death. is death. Sin is do death. You, every, every time you pick a vegetable, do you think, oh, I'm killing this thing? There's no symbolism in, in picking vegetables and offering them. The symbolism is the lamb dies. Okay. So that's it? And you had people who were living close to a thousand years old, and so they had li limited uh, audiovisual aids for understanding as to what death was, because yeah. earlier on, you eat of it, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. they've, so they've Cain didn't bring the proper, proper well, yeah. sacrifice, right. is basically what you're saying. The yeah. symbol was wrong. Well, yeah. So it must not be a symbol anymore if it made them mad. Well, uh, it no, it wasn't, it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't the symbol part of it that made him mad. It was the fact that his, his sacrifice wasn't accepted and Abel's was. Because there was no death in it. Yeah. I think let's, it, let's, let's talk about that, but I, I want to talk about one other thing first. Numbers 21. The Israelites left Mount Hor by the road that leads to the Gulf of Aqaba in order to go around the territory of Edom and so forth. And drop down to verse 4. Uh, I'm sorry, we are in verse 4. In order to go around the territory of Edom. But on the way, the people lost their patience and spoke against God and Moses. They complained, why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in this desert where there is no food or water? 
We can't stand any more of this miserable food. What was it they had been eating for 40 years? Manna. Manna. Angel food. Um, we like to call it angel's food, and I think that's fine, but I, I'm, I'm asking you, pick your favorite food. I don't care what it is. How would you like God to say, okay, this is your food now for the next 40 years? The only food for the next 40 years. <laughs> well, it would be nothing, but you wouldn't get sick of it. <laughs> Boy. Anyway, then the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many Israelites were bitten and died. Does that sound like a friendly thing for God to do? No. No. But we need to compare Scripture with Scripture. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Now pray to the Lord to take these snakes away. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord told Moses to make a metal snake and put it on a pole so that anyone who was bitten could look at it and be healed. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who had been bitten would look at the bronze snake and be healed. What are we supposed to learn from that? Snake on a pole. Mm -hmm. What are we supposed to learn from it? They weren't, they weren't worshiping the snake at that time. They were basically doing what they were told if they believed what they were told. Is God uh, pouting in heaven and getting upset with his children and so he slams them with a bunch of snakes? <laughs> Is it a symbol He'd of He'd been faith? protecting them to that point, but when they started complaining, I guess he wanted to put the brakes well, on. Gardner Myra or somebody over there was saying, got to compare scripture with sick scripture. Right. <laughs> Look at Deuteronomy 8.15 when Moses talks about this experience and now he's reviewing it. And he says, he led you through that vast and terrifying desert where there were poisonous snakes and scorpions. In that dry and wasteless land, he made water flow out of solid rock for you. So what does that tell us? They were wandering off the beaten track, as it were. Well, for the vast majority of time, God was protecting them yes. from the snakes. Mm -hmm. But when they, they brought the snakes on themselves. When they started complaining and complaining and complaining and complaining about God specifically, God says, well, let me take away my protection for a little while and see how you like that. Yeah. Is that a good thing for a parent to do? I don't know. Sometimes. I guess you yeah, could so. say he had to start <laughs> somewhere. I'll show seems, these guys. I'll take like this a, protection away. Seems like an awfully harsh thing to do. Well, what happened as a result of the bronze snake? Those that looked and believed survived. Those that got bitten and didn't, they died. Did they know? Do you, you think the Israelites actually realized that there was no magic, there was no power in the snake itself? Well, yeah. Didn't take them long to pollute it if they did then. <laughs> well, did that really matter with them? Because they're not really a scientific mind minded people people like we are, yeah. and so there could be a little difference there. Mm -hmm. Well, to Why? Christians, go ahead. Well, say, say, if you're going, saying something on that, go ahead. To Christians, looking back, we think immediately of Christ crucified, don't we? Yeah. And there's some, a lot of, you know, if, if we had time, we would go and look at John 12, where there's, and John 3, where it talks about the snake, and specifically this... Uh, Maybe we should take just a moment real quick. Look at John three fourteen and 15. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert, in the same way the Son of Man must be lifted up, okay, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Do you think the Jews had gotten the picture by that time? Well, here, here's Ellen White's words, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 431. The Israelites saved their lives by looking upon the uplifted serpent. That look implied faith. They lived because they believed God's word and trusted in the means provided for their recovery. So why did God take the risk of people saying we're worship that the Israelites were worshiping this, this bronze snake or gold snake, whatever it was? It's, a, it's an idol. And it turns out that they preserved that bronze snake, put it up in front of the temple, yeah. Solomon's temple, and worshipped it for 700 years. Why did he take that risk? That's, that's the next question. 
What's the alternative? Well, l l say, say uh, y Yahweh or, you know, say, um, I, I don't know, okay. something else. Why a snake is right. Well, it's another question we've got to ask when we get to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> Come well, up several every week keep, here. Keep trying to find the answer, though, why in but the meantime let's, it's good. <laughs> let's, let's think about that in practical terms for a moment. The children of Israel had just come out of slavery. Now, they had been wandering the desert for 40 years. They had gotten used to God's guidance. They followed the cloud. They all knew. I mean, they could complain about Moses. But they knew perfectly well that Moses, just like them, was following the cloud. They went where the cloud went. The sanctuary was taken where the cloud went. They knew God's presence was there. It lighted up at night. It was, it was cooled them. It kept, gave them shade during the day. I mean, they know this. There's no way Moses could have done that. They knew that perfectly well. They stopped and think, thought for a moment. But it was true that they had thought in very concrete terms. You know, they, they weren't accustomed to thinking philosophically. They hadn't taken any classes in, you know, bio, in, in biology or chemistry or physics that, you know, taught them about, you know, the characteristics of nature and that kind of stuff. So, I mean, probably God said, that's the best I can do. I need something concrete that they can look at, you know, maybe put their hand on and say, yeah, like, now I get it. And that's what people need today, right? Well. Or not. Some do. Many people do. We're going to talk about that. Okay. Our lesson suggests that what, what's going on here is that we have a substitutionary atonement. What's a substitutionary atonement? Quick old change -o. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what is, since we're using symbols here, what does quick old change -o mean? Well, some, in the, somebody in the place of. Okay. A substitute is someone who takes the place or something that takes the yeah. place of something else, right? So a substitutionary atonement, and I heard one guy recently in fact, the guy who wrote a book saying we shouldn't use the word atonement, we should use attunement. Meaning we're on the same page, we're singing the same tune. I think that's a good point, but anyway. I, I, I think the, wasn't it originally at one meant? At one meant, yes. yes that's the way, the, what the word was at the beginning, yeah. So, and what happened? Let's, let's just think about two different ways you can look at the sanctuary, what happened there. The idea of substitutionary atonement ended up, unfortunately, meaning to the children of Israel, if you have enough lambs, you can keep on sinning. Like indulgences. Yeah. God's plan, at least as I understand it, was to say that, okay, we bring lambs and we cut their throats because we're supposed to learn that sin leads to death. And if I keep on sinning, what happens? I will die in my sins. That's what they were supposed to learn from the sanctuary service. Some would say sins are transferred in substitutionary atonement idea. Sins are transferred to the animal and do, I do not need to worry about them anymore. So I just take my sins, I take them off and I set them on this animal and whee, whoopee, I can go home and do what I want now. And that's, un, you know, I'm not trying to be, I'm trying not to make fun of what God said here, but I'm just saying that that was the attitude of some, and it turned out to be the attitude of the majority. By contrast, I would say what God's plan was, sins are transferred only symbolically. It is not possible to really make an animal guilty of my sins. So it means if you're talking about transferring your sins symbolically, what are you trying to suggest? Well, going to the next step, my sins are transferred by the priest into the tent or tabernacle. So that was the next step. I would suggest the next step was God has a plan for my life to help me leave my sins behind and become more like him. I'm getting rid of my sins not by sort of out making an animal guilty. I'm getting rid of them by stopping to perform them, stopping doing them. Well, then, of course, on the Day of Atonement, my sins are carried by the scapegoat into an unknown land. That's, that's what they saw. They saw the scapegoat being let off by somebody and think, hallelujah, my sins are gone. 
but God wants us to se God wants to separate me from my sins permanently, not just symbolically, right? In the substitutionary approach, my focus is on dealing with my sins. Whereas in what I would call sin leads to death approach, my focus is on Jesus Christ so that I can crowd out my sins and forget about them. Coming back for one final thing on the uh, substitutionary side, because the people were afraid of God, they begged Moses to stand between them and God as an intercessor. Exodus 20, verses 18 to 20. Um, was it ever God's idea for them to have an intercessor? No. Not initially. Now, maybe later when things were really in bad shape, God says, let me work through prophets, let me work through priests, see if I can, can appeal to you better. But God's original plan was for each of us to be priest and not need someone else to represent us before him. That was God's original plan. So the intercessor was plan B or C or D or Q Some, or whatever. Somewhere down there, yeah. yeah. Well, and I guess we should just read Exodus 20, verses 18 to 20. When the people heard that they're... Now this is immediately after the giving of the Ten Commandments. Okay, so what happens? God comes down on the mountain, there's smoke, there's lightning, there's thunder, there's a loud voice, uh, and trumpets are blasting, and everybody's down with their faces in the dirt, and he gives the Ten Commandments. And what's their response? When the people, and I, and I should read the King James Version, just for us to get the full impact. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they removed and stood out far off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, and that you sin not. And if we had time, we would talk about two very contradictory verse understandings of the word fear. They were afraid to, they were afraid to death of what's going on in the mountain, and, and Moses said, What? Fear not. Is there, anyway, we don't have time to talk about that right now. So it, it seems that substitutionary atonement has a total lack of personal responsibility. Well, that's what, unfortunately, by the time of Jesus, the, the, because the priest got a portion of the sacrifice that they would offer, by the time of, times of Jesus, they, almost, the, they were having almost clowning effects and they were juggling animal parts and that kind of stuff. To, to get, because if you get more people to come to you as a priest, then you get more meat, you get more results. It was a, it was a circus. Mm. So you can feed your family more or get more money by selling you it? You probably or sold what? some of it. I don't know. I hate to think that that's what happened, but it's possible. Well, there are many lessons we can learn from the sanctuary. Having recently come out of slavery, as I said, the children of Israel probably couldn't think anything more than concrete terms. To them, the sanctuary service meant God had made a way to take care of their sins. That's as far as they understood it. Are there any people whose lives were kind of, yes? And just coming out of slavery, is it any wonder that they needed something very concrete and you know, that's a step for them, a, a big step forward for them. Mm -hmm. It just, hopefully we're past that step. Yeah, yeah. The, the sanctuary service out there in the, in the wilderness was a kind of sandbox illustration. You know, we have, we have sandboxes in kindergarten and cradle roll and we put things there and it sticks in the sand and the children are all excited about it, but as adults we probably need to look past that. There are even people's lives in the Old Testament that were symbolic of what was coming in the life of Jesus. Can you think of some? Job. Job, okay. Job is a good example of going through a lot of stuff that uh, Jesus went through, kind of trouble he went through, and I would say, I would go the next step and say similar to things that people will go through at the end of time. Can you think of anybody else in the Old Testament that was, whose life was a little bit symbolic of Jesus. Oh, Moses. Okay. He, Moses even said, a prophet is going to come like me, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Joseph is often compared to Jesus in, in many ways. 
So here, here were people's lives that were, in, in a sense, a symbol. Well, so now let's come to Jeremiah. We've done other things long enough. Look at Jeremiah 18, verses 1 to 10. The Lord said to me, Go down to the potter's house where I will give you my, uh, my message. Now, what was the function of a potter in the days of Jeremiah? Well, they made things to drink out of, eat out of, store things in. Pottery, did, I mean, almost everything was done. Was and even, fortunately, archaeologists are very thankful for pottery because, you know, you, uh, you couldn't help but break a pot every once in a while. And then those broken pieces of pottery became often scratch pads for people to write things on. So pottery became very important in many ways, many ways. Also, different areas, different parts of the country yeah. had uh, different, different types of pottery, and, and in different air ages, time they periods. had time periods, they had uh, different ones, so they could tend to date things. Yeah, so they now, they even by small, finding a relatively small piece of a pot, a good archaeologist can often say, well, this is a such and such a kind of a pot, and it came from such and such a place from such and such a time period. Some of those pots were big. They stored yeah. grain in them. I mean, Some these were three huge. or four feet high, big pots. Imagine well, the, imagine the uh, commercial travel back and forth carried pots from yeah. one area, part of the country yep. to another. Absolutely. Yeah. So whenever a piece of pottery turned out imperfect, the potter is trying to work with this clay, what would he do? He would take the clay and make it into something else. Then the Lord said to me, Haven't I the right to do with you people of Israel what the potter did with the, with the clay? You are in my hands just like clay in the potter's hands. If at any time I say that I'm going to uproot, break down, destroy any nation or kingdom, but then that nation turns from its evil, I will not do what I said I would. Hmm. This is an interesting development. On the other hand... Does that sound like conditional prophecy? It does kind of sound like Did that, doesn't it? about that recently? On the other hand, if I say that I'm going to plant or build up any nation or kingdom, but then that nation disobeys me and, and does not evil, I will not do what I said I would. So that's not quite like just clay in the potter's hand, is it? Or as he says, I will repent mm -hmm. of the good which I intended to do to it. Mm -hmm. So what are we supposed to learn from that parable? I mean, I don't think anyone, at least at this table, has any question about the fact that God created us all in the beginning, right? So, if God created us, does that mean that we're already formed and we're baked and we don't have any choice in the matter? Once you bake a pot, it's pretty much set in its ways, isn't it? The pot is, but what it holds can be a lot of different things. That's true, yeah. So, but here it says that if people change their minds, God responds differently. And Gordon suggested that might have something to do with conditional prophecy. Hmm. Does our behavior affect God in any way? Now you who recognize that there are many of our Christian friends who believe that God is so sovereign, he's so far up there that nothing we can do will ever change him. You know, and of course there are those who go to the final step and say that we're all predestined, some are saved and some are lost, and nothing you do has anything to do with your salvation. Is that true? Does any of that say that he changes at all? Well, it says it said there that if, if you know if you change your mind and you start doing good things, you were bad. Now you start doing good things. God changes. He, he treats you differently. But on the other hand, if you were good and then you turn to doing bad things, He treats you differently. Yeah, but if I go up on a building and, and want to jump off and then change my mind, it doesn't change God. That's any a little because late. He affects, because you your your decisions bring on things naturally. Mm -hmm. So that isn't really God changing, is it? Well, okay, let me, let me take your illustration. Do you think God is going to take a whole lot of people to heaven who make up their minds to join his side just the very last second? He could. 
That's not what I asked. I he said he would, but I don't think he would. Well, why? If he joins us, their side, why not? A, the, as you yeah. said it. Okay. As you said it, but yeah. the question is, can they really yeah, that's change the question. their mind at the last minute? Mm -hmm. The principle is that behavior has its rewards. You uh, do what he asks you to do long enough and understand it, you're going to live. But if you don't, you die. A natural result of the truth. When you go along with the truth, you you pretty well have a good life. But if you go against the truth, that truth is going to turn around and bop you on the head. It isn't that truth is changing its mind. It's just that you're going one way or the other. You're either going against it or you're going with it. Isaiah commented like this in Isaiah 29, verse 16. They turn everything upside down. Which is more important, the potter? Or the clay? Can a thing which someone has made say to its maker, you didn't make me? Or you don't know what you're doing? <laughs> Try to imagine that. The pot says, you didn't, you know. As if a pot could talk, huh? Yeah. Well, we would do that in the movies today, I'm sure. <laughs> Certainly in the cartoons. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people talked about the symbolism of a potter with his clay. Paul did in Romans 9, and it began to be a very controversial thing. Let's read a couple of those verses. Look at Romans 9, starting with verse 18. So then God has mercy on anyone he wishes, and he makes stubborn anyone he wishes. So that settles it, right? God just does it. But one of you will say to me, if this is so, how can, you, how can God find fault with anyone? Who can resist God's will? But who are you, my friend, to answer back to answer God back? A clay pot does not ask the man who made it, why did you make me like this? After all, the man who makes the pots has a right to use the clay as he wishes and to make two pots from the same lump of clay, one for special cases and another for ordinary use. Bang. Doesn't that solve the problem? Or does that make the problem worse? <laughs> What's it, it makes it sound like some have no choice. Mm -hmm. It makes and it makes it sound like God could be it could be very arbitrary. Yes. Is that the way God is? No. So why did I think why Paul did you talk spent about? several chapters before that saying how God really worked? Yes. Rather than arbitrarily. Mm -hmm. So in Romans one to eight, Paul says he sort of lays out God's plan of salvation, and he recognizes that when his book gets to Rome. Half, at least half of the people in that congregation there in Rome are going to be former Jews. And another half, or I don't know exactly what the proportion was, another proportion of that congregation is going to be Gentiles who have become Christians. And as people, whoever it was, stood up to read the scroll that Paul has written to the church in Rome, I can see those Jews saying, hold on a minute. We've been faithful all these years. We've, uh, we're, we're descended from Abraham and so forth. What are you trying to do? Saying that these Gentiles can be saved in the same way we're saved? That's no good. Paul, what's wrong with you? And so Paul says, okay, doesn't God have a right to make things the way he wants to make them? Well, okay, yeah, and... So this is the argument. So he's, he's trying to set his Jewish friends back a little bit who are about to rise up and revolt as they hear Paul's book of Romans being read to them. So he's saying that these Gentiles were obviously made, right? Mm -hmm. And so if he made them, la da da. God has a right to save them in any way he chooses. Mm -hmm. That's the question. The Jews wanted to say how God could save or couldn't save, and God says, nothing doing. I will decide how I will save people, how I will not save people. Okay. Well, Jeremiah 18 goes on to say that while the potter can make the clay into almost anything he chooses, human beings have basically two choices. And what are those two choices? We can join God's side or we can join Satan's side. Live or die. On the other hand, well, so forth. what does God need to do to convince us that sin is self-destructive? Who doesn't want us to know that sin is self-destructive? Absolutely. Well, 
Jeremiah went on to say that we may respond or we may not respond. Is that a part of God's ultimate sovereignty? That he gives us that capacity to respond in one way or another? Does that eliminate human freedom? Some people think so. Well, what do we do with God's statement there in Romans 9? It's interesting that he starts out by talking about Jacob and Esau. And he quotes how, you know, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. And if you just read it superficially and you don't, you're not familiar with the Old Testament, you think, wow, I mean, God did that back in the beginning? No, the I love Jacob and I hated Esau statement is made when? In Malachi. In Malachi, okay? When, were, when did Jacob, you know, Jacob and Esau were way back in Genesis. So the statement, I, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau, was made hundreds of years later. That's, that's just what, I mean, Esau's family and so forth turned away from God, and Jacob's family stayed toward God. And so when someone doesn't hear us at some other time, what, I guess what that means is I loved Jacob more than I loved Esau, or they Jacob's family responded more than Esau's family yes. did. Yeah. So, and that's basically what Paul is going on to say in, in Romans. He's saying, you know, everyone has an opportunity to respond. You don't, you don't have a better chance because you have certain kind of blood flowing through your veins. You know, everybody has a chance. Well, if we're going to say that the main point of Scripture is God's sovereignty, does that raise any other questions in your mind? Like, does he have to make sense out of anything, or can he just... Well, he if God is absolutely in charge, and he's the one who decides, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and so forth. Why are we here? Why are we here, and... Why are we still... Why are we in this mess? Why are we still... Why, why hasn't God done something about this mess? If he intends to do something, if you go to Revelation 20, it says he's going to grab the devil and lock him up. He's going to let him out after a while, but... I mean, why... If God is totally in control and we have nothing to say about it whatsoever, why didn't he do that 5,000 years ago? Do people that believe that have an answer for that? No. <laughs> Wait, you're saying, the way you phrased it though, um, is there a time when God is out of control? No. No. So when is the point where God is not in control? I mean, no. do you call that God's not in control when people are sinning? It's called freedom of choice. It's called freedom, freedom of choice, yeah. Yeah. My freedom, your freedom. But he's still in control. Abraham's freedom. Does, does Satan doubt God's power? No. Not at all. James 2.19. The devil's fear and tremble. God know. I mean, Satan knows that God has all the power. He understands that perfectly well. The issue is not who has the power, although so many people think that's one of the main issues at least. What matters is who's telling us the truth. That's the part that really matters. And telling us the truth about what? Well, specifically about sin leading to death. And what happens when you rebel against God and you go as fast as you can in the other direction. Well. Are we tempted to worship other gods instead of Jehovah in our day? What are the most important things in our lives? Do we ex trust exclusively in God? Or do we depend on our retirement plans, our bank accounts, our nice homes, our new cars? That wouldn't happen to any of us, right? Careful, now you're going to meddling. <laughs> meddling, okay. Well, in Jeremiah's day, the children of Israel had turned to other gods by burning incense, even in the temple grounds to those other gods. And Jim was going to tell us that they were even baking cakes to the Queen of Heaven, right there in Solomon's temple. The whole family was involved. And, 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 and the and, children are gathering the yeah, sticks, yeah. and the fathers are kindling the fire, yeah. and the women are kneading dough to bake cakes for the Queen of Heaven to provoke God to anger. Yeah. But he says, is it I whom they provoke rather than themselves? Yeah. So what does sin do? Sin is self-destructive. That's not, not what it does to God. And, and the they, Queen of Heaven was? One of the 
one of the pagan gods, one of the fertility gods. Four times it refers to the yeah. Queen of Heaven in Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Well, the people in Jeremiah's day seem to think that, I don't know whether they thought God really was blind or maybe he was off on vacation somewhere and so they could go to the fertility cult shrines all week long and then they just come to the temple on Sabbath and God doesn't know any different. I mean, and then if you move into the temple with your pagan sacrifices, even sacrificing your children, Solomon sacrificed his children and other ones. Uh, it just blows my mind to think about it. And that was how many years? That was about, what, 300 years prior to this? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's something Actually, about, a little hu bit more than that. Something about human beings have a great, almost a default position to go toward some mm -hmm. element of paganism. It just is. Why is it? Why is it? Let's, let's follow up in your question. Why is it? that human beings, even when all the evidence is pointing one direction, we seem to run the other way as fast as we can go. The children of Israel were supposed to be sent, put in the land of Canaan at the center of the then known world so they could be examples of the advantages of living a godlike life. All the other nations were supposed to be learning from them. And what were they doing? They were learning how to become pagans as fast as they could. Finally, we're going to read when we get further along that they were more sinful than the people they drove out of the land of Can Canaan. More evil. Well, so, lest we um, miss the point here, how are we regarded by our neighbors and associates? Are we representing God to them? Or are they uh, <coughs> inviting us to the movies and other places we shouldn't be and doing things we shouldn't be doing? Are they comfortable with their co concept of God? And if their concept of God is not is false, they have an idol, don't they? Yeah. And if we have the wrong concept of God, we have an idol. And if we propagate it and tell teach others our wrong concept, we're slandering God, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 19 verse 5 says, They have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I committed not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. I'm reading from the King James again, just to make it very blunt. Neither came it into my mind. God never, ever had the idea that they should do anything as strange. I mean, can you imagine a loving God, the kind of God we worship, wanting people to offer their children to him. I just found another place where that is referenced, uh, something here in uh, Jeremiah 7, 31. Mm -hmm. uh, and they built high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to yeah. burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come to, into my mind. Yeah. So, I mean, um, many times too here we get the yeah. things over and over. And, but this, when Jesus was here, didn't he refer to it was Gehenna, which is basically the same area, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and, but uh, Christian religions have taught that well, it's, it's hell. No, he says you don't want to go to destruction. It wasn't, God wasn't, Jesus wasn't threatening them. No. It's just, hey. Trying to warn them. Yeah. Yeah. But I dare ask the question. You said, how could anyone consider sacrificing their son or daughter? What about Abraham and Isaac? Abraham offering Isaac. That was an old pagan c custom. Yeah, I know, but uh, you know, what's... Why couldn't he have found it, another way? Do you way? suppose there's, there's another way of looking at it, and that is Abraham misunderstood. Because ultimately he didn't do it, and then he t says, take that, that pagan deity, that ram, not a lamb, take that ram. A ram was a symbol of, there again we're back into symbols, of, of p pagan gods around the area in, in mm -hmm. Egypt and so forth. So. Well, the, I, I, I wouldn't want to go that far. I'm inclined to think that God actually told him to do that. And the question is why? Two people in Abraham's day offering a child was the ultimate sacrifice. That's right. And Abraham had several times, you know, stepped aside from what God wanted him to do. And so now God is saying to him, okay, are you prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice? And Abraham, you know, was in prayer day and night.
for three days struggling with this. He learned an enormous lesson, and the universe, looking on, learned an enormous lesson. Look at pages 151 to about 153 in Patriarchs and Prophets. It talks about that. Recognize that here's someone who said, I will do God's will even though it seems like the worst possible thing. So, And yet when Solomon offers his son or daughter, that's... Well... Yeah, it, 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 it's a different situation, yeah. but, but there's so many things that are alike. Yeah. And he actually offered them. Yeah. Well, look at another, another parable, uh, if you will. The broken jar. Jeremiah 19. The Lord told me to go and buy a clay jar. He also told me to take some of the elders of the people and some of the older priests and to go through Potsherd Gate out to the valley of Hinnom. What's a Potsherd? Broken pottery. A broken piece of pottery. So this is probably somewhere close to where the potters worked and the broken pieces that they were mistakes or, or whatever probably got chucked out through that gate. There I was to proclaim the message that he would give me. The Lord told me to say, Kings of Judah and people of Jerusalem, listen to what I, the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, have to say. I'm going to bring such a disaster on this place that everyone who hears about it will be stunned. I'm going to do this because the people have abandoned me. Notice what happens first. They have abandoned me and defiled this place by offering sacrifices here to other gods. Gods that neither they nor their ancestors nor the kings of Judah have known anything about. They have filled this place with the blood of innocent people and they have built altars for Baal in order to burn their children in the fire as sacrifices. I never commanded them to do this. It never even entered my mind. We looked at that verse before. So then the time will come when the place will no longer be called Tophet and so forth. And if you drop, I'm, we're running out of time, so I'm going to go down. So what did he do with the pot? Remember? Shattered he the pot. Shattered the pot. And he said, this is what's going to happen to the people of Jerusalem and Judah. Yeah. They'll become useless. Well, what, what, of what use is a broken pot? Not much. Just dating architecturally. It, it can be used for scratch pad, maybe, sometimes, if you're in ancient times. Well, how many of us are actually carrying out God's plan for our lives? Are we carrying out God's mission? One more le the thing that the lesson wants us to cover is found in Jeremiah 13. The Lord told me to go and buy myself some linen shorts and to put them on. But he told me not to put them in water. Okay, so in the original langu language, it'll say a loincloth, like a like a pair, kind of like a piece of under, a pair of underwear. So I bought them and put them on. Then the Lord spoke to me again and said, "Go to the river Euphrates and hide the shorts in a hole in the rocks." So I went and hid them near the Euphrates. How far is the Euphrates away from oh. Jerusalem? Long, hundreds of miles. Hundreds of miles. It, take, it would have taken him three or four months just to walk mm -hmm. one way. Well, depending on how fast he walked. I don't know, maybe he was a really fast walker, but the usual way, it would take three or four months just one way. We don't know whether this, this Euphrates had some other meaning, this word. Uh, it's not the usual word for Euphrates, uh, so there's a possibility that it could have had some other meaning. But anyway, what happened then? <clears throat> a little while later, God says, go back again. What did he find? Rags. Yeah. Rags, basically, yeah. Useless. Another example of if you just do nothing, you just let your life sort of sit and do nothing, you follow the heathen and pagan ways, what happens? You become useless. Was there some important symbol in the shorts themselves or is this linen linen or the shorts or is this just a linen arbitrary... what's linen made out of it's made out of flax right. it's a natural fiber it's fairly easily corrupted by weevils and, and, and insects and so forth like this I, I think probably it's just God knew that there would be a good example of how it probably was not not much left of them at all after they've been left there by the river for a little while
Well, you finish the go on into the chapter and it says they won't listen. Yeah. They won't take instruction. That's it's all all through the Old Testament. God says they won't listen. They won't take instruction. So now that we have these messages, how are we supposed to respond? Well, some people would take Isaiah 55 verse 8, and this would be their clue. My thoughts, says the Lord, are not like yours, and my ways are different from yours. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways and thoughts above yours. So, okay, you don't have to worry about understanding the meaning of these things, and why not? God's, eye, God's thoughts are way up there. We can never understand them anyway, right? But also in Isaiah, earlier in Isaiah, Isaiah 1.18, what does it say? Now let us reason together. Come now and let us reason together. I, th I don't know when he says your thoughts are not uh, neither are your ways my ways and they're his are heavy, higher. I think he says you're just people I can't you're not listening. Mm -hmm. It's uh, you're not thinking right. There are many I mean, philosophical ways in which people have tried to tie other people in knots. I can remember when I was young people would come up I mean, one of the things they would do is they'd come up and say to you can God do anything? Can God do anything he wants? Or can God do anything? specific thing. Oh yeah, sure, God can do anything. Can he make a rock big enough so he can't move it? <laughs> can't well, force you to love. Yeah, can't force you to love. Exactly. Of course, to human beings, the greatest conundrum of all is the existence of sin. If we do not understand the story of the great controversy from the point of Satan's rebellion in heaven to his final destruction after the third coming, it is very likely that we will be confused. And Ellen White said these words in Great Controversy 492, To many minds, the origin of sin and the reason for its existence are a source of great perplexity. They see the work of evil with its terrible results of woe and desolation, and they question how all this can exist under the sovereignty of one who is infinite in wisdom and power and in love. So if God is a sovereign, he's absolutely in charge, nothing bad should happen, right? Here's a mystery of which they find no explanation, and in their uncertainty and doubt, they are blinded to truths plainly revealed in God's Word and essential to salvation. And what are some of those truths? We're in the middle of a great controversy, aren't we? And the, man, the person who should have been standing next to God's throne, the one who should have been, you know, the ultimate re was originally the best representative for God chose to rebel. And how does God respond to that? What should God do? Knowing God didn't protect Lucifer. No. So since this is a lesson about symbols, let's draw some conclusions. Are there advantages and disadvantages to using symbols? No. Somebody wants to take them literally. <laughs> okay, somebody might take them very literally. Some, in some cases, that would be a problem. Someone well, might misinterpret the symbol. They might misinterpret the symbol and not just un not even understand it at all. The, the disciples kept asking Jesus, "What did you mean by that?" Right. So that's a disadvantage. What are the advantages? We've already mentioned a number of them. Usually, by by talking about something that people can picture in their minds, the idea sticks, doesn't it? So that would be the advantages. Do we have a clear understanding of how bad things are, things have become in Jerusalem and in Judea in Jeremiah's day? Do we really understand? What would have led them to offer their own children as sacrifices to a pagan god? How do you think God and the angels feel when, if, if felt when they saw someone come and offer their, their baby, their child? Can you imagine that? I mean, it, you know, it upsets us. How did they feel? I think there'd be a lot of sorrow. And if angels can rejoice at one of us being converted, I think they can yeah. go the other way. Luke 15, yeah, it talks <coughs> about the angels rejoice in heaven, yeah, when someone comes back. Well, do we have any idea what, how our sins make God feel today? Do they make him angry or do they make him sad? As we approach the end of time, should we be using more symbols or should we 
be more blunt. Whatever gets the message across. Okay. Sometimes symbols can be very forceful, very powerful, huh? Yeah. Especially for visually oriented people. And it could be auditorially oriented people as well. Well, now we are 170 years past the Great Disappointment in 1844. Sometime soon, probation will close and there will be no changing after that. Everyone will have made up his own mind about God. God does not preemptively judge us until we have been given that opportunity. Do you think the people of Jerusalem really understood the symbols of the smashed clay pot and the rotten linen shorts? I think they were beyond it at that time. Mm -hmm. They didn't care in the end. Sometimes symbols can be a little bit confusing. <coughs> a, a snake represented devil the back in the, begin in the Garden of Eden, didn't he? And there'll be a snake representing the devil when we get to the book of Revelation. So why do we have a snake here in the middle? We say, we Christians like to say, oh, we like to hasten and say, no, this is, this is the snake that represents Jesus Christ being put on a cross. That can be a little confusing in the minds of some, I'm sure. Well, has Satan used symbols very successfully? Did any of the ancient, did, did the ancient pagans recognize that their idols were not really gods, but they just supposedly represented something larger? You know, there's Christian churches in our day that have symbols, and they will tell you, oh, the reason we use those icons, they might call them, is because some people aren't ignorant, are ignorant of the Bible story, so this is, we have to, we have to paint the Bible stories using the saints and so forth so they can understand them. Is that the approach we ought to take? No. Well, there are a lot of symbols in the Bible. We're running out of time. You can look, if you look at our handout, it's available on at theox.org. Lots of co different kinds of symbols. Jeremiah had a lot of different symbols just in his book alone. And symbols may play a big part in our lives today. Think about what symbols mean to you and what symbols teach you something important about God. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to discuss your will, to discuss what these passages in the Scripture are supposed to mean to us. We ask now that as we, as others, li listen in on, on the, our discussions that they may learn something important about you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.